So welcome to everybody joining us in our Zoom meeting. Um, we just have a couple minutes to, for before class gets started. Um, so hang in there and we'll be starting right at 11 a.m. So just a minute to go and then we'll get started with our class geometry in nature. So welcome everybody. And I'm just gonna stop sharing my screen. It's just about 11 o'clock. So in a moment, I'm gonna turn everything over to our excellent AmeriCorps educator, Michael Simonell. Um, my name of course is Drew Bush and I'm the director of programs at the Fairbanks Museum and Planetarium. And we're excited to have you here for today's class, whether you're joining us in Zoom or whether you're following along on our YouTube live stream. Um, of course, some of you may even be viewing this later on, on Kingdom Access Television or your other local cable television, and we appreciate you tuning in as well. Um, for those in our Zoom meeting, I just wanted to review a couple quick options for how you can participate in today's session. You can, at the bottom of your screen, if you move your cursor, find a Q&A box, and we would welcome all of your questions in there. Um, you can even ask to submit them so that you're anonymous, um, but if you don't mind sharing your username, you can also ask them there. Um, Michael and I will do our best to either answer them in written form or I'll raise my hand for you and ask Michael to answer them during his session today. You can, of course, as a number of people have already noticed, chat with us in our chat box as well. So that's another great way to get our attention or maybe to answer questions that Michael poses during today's session. Um, and then finally, for those of you on YouTube, you'll notice you also have a chat window. So I'll be paying close attention to that chat window in your YouTube live stream and feel free to ask questions on there. And you can definitely also interact today and have Michael answer your questions live. Um, just so you know, we have, are of course recording this video and we'll be archiving it and posting it on our website. So be aware of that when you're asking questions or taking part today. Um, and visit fairbanksmuseum.org for just a wonderful array of online programs that are on our front page, on our Facebook, and of course, in the virtual learning tab where you probably look to get join us today. So once again, I want to introduce you to Michael. All right. Hello, everybody. My name is Michael, of course. Um, thank you for coming to my class today. We're going to be discussing um, geometry in nature, or really the shapes and patterns that we find all around us in the plants and animals that we live around and also just simply in the non-living natural environment. A lot of these shapes and patterns we ignore every day because we're so used to them, but it's extremely interesting to discuss really exactly why things in nature formed the way that they did. So for instance, one, you know, incredibly interesting example, we have a lot of these particularly at the museum for you to see, but this is a this is a quartz crystal. This would have been formed underground 
in essentially uh, in, in volcanic conditions, right? So this is a kind of, it's an igneous rock crystal that forms inside of lava bubbles. And I think this one particularly actually came from uh, New Hampshire. It came from the large super volcano that used to be in Franconia Notch where, um, where Cannon Mountain and Mount Lafayette are today. But it, of course, if you look at any crystal, um, you can see that it has a very particular specific geometrical form, right? You may have trouble seeing this crystal through your screen here, but this particularly large chunk here almost looks as if it was cut with human hands. It has very precise angles, very flat surfaces, and it really, all of these crystals are actually nearly perfect hexagons. They're all six-sided figures that come to a point. So this crystal was perfectly naturally formed. No human hands uh, went into shaping it in this particular way, although it looks that way. There are lots of examples in nature like this, where things, whether they be plants or animals or minerals, take a very specific shape, and you have to wonder why they form that way. So this class will talk about why certain shapes and patterns in nature form the way that they do. And of course, when you go to school and you learn geometry or algebra and you learn about these shapes, of course, it's easy to forget that humans didn't invent these shapes and numbers, right? When we talk about all of the different shapes of geometry, hexagons, triangles, circles, squares, um, in, in a school environment, you know, we think about them as things that humans make and draw, but really human beings learned these shapes and patterns from the natural environment, right? And in particular, just to set the scene for you in terms of talking about geometry and shapes, geometry is a Greek word which means literally to measure shapes. Metri, like metric, and then geo, shape. So geometry was, was a, a type of math, a type of art that was invented by the Greeks even before the Greeks had really came up with algebra or the kind of math that we do today. In fact, you have to kind of imagine yourself back in time, you know, with these Greek mathematicians, you know, wearing togas, sitting, you know, in the forum, discussing math. And these, these ancient Greek mathematicians were doing algebra, were doing the kind of math that you do in school without numbers. Could you imagine that? Imagine only using shapes and the ratios between the sides of those shapes to do all of the math that you guys do in school when you do geometry or calculus or any kind of math. It's incredible. If you read Euclid's elements, Euclid was one of these mathematicians who first wrote down really the first math textbook is Euclid's Elements. It's a massive textbook. I had to read it in college. And when you go through that book, you have to go almost halfway through the entire textbook to the seventh chapter until you get to numbers. Before then, all you're using is shapes to do all of the math in that book. So that's a hard thing to imagine, but it helps to show just how important geometry and the study of shapes is to mathematics, right? So let's get started here with some of the shapes and patterns that are formed in nature. And so I'll give you an example here of both a shape and a pattern that you're all familiar with, but you may not know really the story of why it's formed the way it is. Now, just to refresh you, of course, a pattern is any kind of sequence of shapes or colors or numbers or words that repeat over and over again, right? A pattern is any sequence that you can repeat infinitely, right? Particularly here, this is an example from a wasp nest. This is from a, well, this is a white faced hornet nest, actually. And of course, you've all seen this, whether it's a honeycomb or whether in a wasp nest, these cells are an example of a repeating pattern, right? All of these cells fit together perfectly and they're all pretty much perfect hexagons. They're all perfect six-sided figures. 
Now, if you look at any hornet's nest, any wasp's nest, any bee's nest, all of these creatures that are all in the same family, the Hymenoptera family, they all make combs or cells of this exact same pattern. They're always hexagons and they always fit together just like this. But why is that? Why do all of these animals build the exact same type of pattern in their homes, right? Well, so imagine this. All of these are hexagons, but what if this comb, all of these cells were made out of circles, all drilled together like that? If these wasps built their comb using circles instead of hexagons, imagine all of those circles stacked right up next to one another, as close as possible. With circles, even if you build those little circles as close as possible together, you're still going to have wasted space, right? In between all of those circles. These little cells, the purpose of them is actually to fit little baby wasps inside of each one of these cells so that they could have a protected space so that they could be fed and grow, you know, in a warm and safe environment, right? If you build these cells out of circles, there's going to be all of the small wasted space in between each of the circles, those little triangle shaped spaces where the circles can't exactly meet one another and they'll be too small to fit a baby wasp in and they'll really be wasted space. So over time, bees and wasps figured out through the, the process of evolutionary selection and uh, natural development and evolution, right? Bees and wasps figured out that a hexagon shape was the optimal or best shape to build their homes out of because, and you can see here, you can take hexagons and stack them together as close as possible without any wasted space, right? Hexagons lock into one another kind of like puzzle pieces and you can make this comb as big or as small as you want without any wasted space between all of these hexagons. And in fact, bees and wasps are so good at making these hexagonal hives that it's almost impossible to find a cell that's been messed up. Every once in a while, there's like a 0.5% chance that you'll find a cell at the edges of a comb that only has five sides because the bees and wasps messed up. It takes, in some cases, hundreds of wasps working together to build one comb like this. So it's really a, a group project. And even though there are so many different animals working together, they can still make these almost perfect shapes, right? So that's an example of one type of shape and pattern, that hexagonal hive that is created by nature. But now we're gonna talk about some more shapes and patterns in nature, why they form and what purpose they serve, right? So I'm gonna show you guys a PowerPoint here. So I'm gonna change my screen over to that and get it started here. Okay, so this first picture that you're seeing here, this is actually an X-ray of a shell, a shell that's very much like this shell here, if you can still see my screen, from a sea snail. <laughs> These are large shells that you certainly won't find anymore in Vermont um, on the surface. Although you will find these in some places if you dig, uh, dig around deep into the ground because in a lot of places, Vermont used to actually be uh, part of the sea back thousands of years ago. So you actually still can find shells and the bones of sea life buried underground. But this shell in particular here, we, we're looking at the X-ray so that we can see that it has a spiral shape inside of it, right? A spiral, I'm sure you guys are familiar with, is a pattern, you, a lot of people would call it a swirl or something like that, that you can draw infinitely outward, you can make an infinitely big spiral or you can keep drawing it really small into the center. And these spirals are called nature's favorite shape. You have to kind of look around for them, but 
nature uses the spiral more than any other pattern when it when uh, in the design of lots of plants and animals. So we'll see that in just a little bit. But uh, do we have a question, Drew? Yeah. So I think this one's coming um, back from when you were talking about the wasp homes, but. Uh, Cooper would like to know, do any other animals make hexagon homes? Oh, hmm. that, that is interesting. I don't know of any other animals that make hexagonal combs, but there are, um, hmm. actually there are some, there are some insects like butterflies that actually have their eggs that are, hexagonally shaped. Um, you can find a lot of very cool shapes by looking at insect eggs. They're very small and easy to miss. Um, a lot of them are circles, of course, but a lot of them are other kinds of fantastic shapes, like, uh, like you know, dodecahedrons, like many-sided geometrical spheres. So that's one place to look for hexagons is in, uh, is in animal eggs. But I don't know of any other animal that makes hives or uh, with, with hexagons like wasps and bees do. Any other questions, Drew? Okay, good. So I wanted to start off with this image of something that's actually from the collections at the museum. Um, and actually this next item, we have something very similar at the museum, but these are cuttlefish. You won't find these in Vermont anymore, but these animals are related to squid and octopus. They're a kind of mollusk. We have a lot of ancient mollusk shells at the museum, which are quite cool. But these guys, they don't have external shells anymore. So they're very fleshy. And if you know anything about cuttlefish and octopus, they have the very special ability to change the color and pattern of their skin at will, kind of like a chameleon can. So they can have all different kinds of patterns and colors. And in particular, these cuttlefish here, they're cuddling right now as we speak. They are both using this kind of striped pattern. And now when you think of animals that have patterns on their bodies, they usually use it for camouflage, right? Think about the squirrels that you see in Vermont that have either gray or red coloring on their fur so that they blend in with the trees that they live on, right? These cuttlefish are not blending into their environment right now with their striped, uh, with their striped skin. But what this camouflage is used for is actually not necessarily for blending in with the background, right? Oh, we have a question. Let's do the question fast here. Yeah, we actually have two. Okay. Um, one is, why does the cuttlefish look like it has an octopus mouth, but also has fins? And maybe you should answer that one first, and then I'll ask you the other one. Okay, right. Cuttlefish are they're right related to squids and octopus, and it does have the eight tentacles of a squid or an octopus, and that's where its mouth is too, like you said. Um, but also, just like squids, they do have fins all across. Uh, that large body part on the right, which is called the mantle of the squid or, or of the cuttlefish in this case. So they actually have both and they use both to, to move themselves through the water, right? <laughs> and second question is, do they have eyes? Oh yeah, you, they, the eyes look very different from human eyes or a lot of land animal eyes. Um, they're a funny U shape. If you look at the top of that, top cuttlefish. You can see two bulges on top of its head and you can actually see that U-shaped pupil of its eye. So it actually has very large eyes um, on top of its head there. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so it, looking at the pattern on this cuttlefish, it might remind you of the pattern that's on a zebra, right? These black and white stripes. Um, in fact, these Stripes are used for the same reason that a zebra has its stripes. And the reason is your eyes will actually get very confused. They'll actually get scrambled and messed up if you try to watch one of these cuttlefish as it's swimming by you. These kinds of black and white lines 
they actually are a special kind of camouflage that confuses your eyeballs. And the effect is called the dazzle effect. It actually makes it really hard to watch the cuttlefish and see how fast it's moving or where it's going. Um, unfortunately, I can't show you the cuttlefish moving right now, but humans have actually figured out how to use this camouflage too. And so this is a, a ship, an old ship, that's using the exact same technique. It has that kind of black and white stripe camouflage. And just by looking at it, I'm sure you can see that it's very hard to tell where the ship ends and where the water begins and where the sky begins. It actually really messes with your eyeballs. In fact, if you look at it for long enough, it'll actually start to kind of give you a headache. Um, <laughs> so that's how this kind of camouflage works. Yes. So I think our students today are really thinking about the patterns of the cuttlefish and what you're talking about. And they're wondering, are the patterns always the same? And are they the same for male and female in particular? Ah, okay. One That's good. question after that too. Mm. Right. So because the cuttlefish can change the colors and patterns of their skin whenever they want to, what they will usually do is whenever they move to a new place, like if they're in a coral reef or something like that, that has lots of different colored uh, corals and animals, they can make their skin very colorful to blend in. Or when they're on a sandy bottom, that's all one color, one brown color, they can change their skin to be a brown color so that they can blend in with the brown sandy bottom. The question about the difference between male and female is interesting. And they, they, can, they both can make the same colors and patterns in their skin, but particularly when they're, when they're trying to find a mate, they'll make their skin kind of like very flashy and they can actually make it change colors very quick um, to try to attract a mate. Similar to how some birds can change, change their color during mating season or peacocks with their, you know, very colorful tail displays, right? So, yeah. And similar. you started to speak to this question a little bit, but um, one student is wondering is what, is the cuttlefish's habitat. So I know you talked about sandy bottoms, but they're wondering more, I guess, specifically. Yeah, so the cuttle, <laughs> cuttlefish are a very interesting uh, creature, but a lot like some kinds of squid, they do prefer shallow water, like reefs or areas like that. And they do hang out uh, close to the bottom. You can tell uh, they're, kind of, they're kind of chubby animals. They're not particularly fast or agile. Uh, so they stay in shallow water where there are not too many big predators. Um, they can also hide really well at the, at the, on the seabed, right? Which is kind of what you can see these guys doing here. <laughs> okay. Is that the last question, Drew? Okay. <laughs> so in terms of patterns, now we're moving kind of to the other end of the spectrum. This guy is hard to see in this image here. But this is a picture of a snow leopard, right? It's in its natural environment, not particularly snowy in this picture. It's probably summertime. But you can still see how well this animal blends into the environment because of the spot camouflage that it has on its body. It lives in rocky mountainous areas. And those dark spots on its white fur help it to blend in on these rocky outcroppings, right? So this is another kind of camouflage similar to the cuttlefish, but this animal is using that camouflage for a very different purpose, right? Cuttlefish and zebra use that dazzle effect camouflage to basically confuse the brains of predators so that they can't be caught, right? This leopard, on the other hand, is using its camouflage a lot like you or people you know might use camouflage if they're going deer hunting, right? This leopard is sneaking up on its prey, right? Stalking its prey, where it's completely still or moving very, very, very slowly to try to approach an animal that it's trying to hunt, right? And with these patterns, even if it's moving very, very slowly, it'll be so difficult to tell that there's anything moving there that maybe a deer or a small mammal, anything that this leopard is trying to catch won't be able to see that it's moving. If you're wearing a camouflage suit and you're sitting in a tree stand, 
waiting for a deer to come by, you have the same effect, right? You're blending in with the environment. And if you move very slowly or keep completely still, it'll be very hard for animals to see you. Yes, Drew? So a question, is this leopard in the tiger family? And actually a few other questions coming in too, but that's the first one, I guess. <laughs> So leopard, leopards are particularly cool. They are felines, so they are related to tigers and even house cats. But these animals are actually in the, they're in the, the mountain lion group, the mountain lion family. So they're actually very closely related to the mountain lions that used to be all over Vermont, and now there are just a few left. Uh, these animals live in other parts of the world, uh, particularly in places like Siberia and Russia, northern China, places like that. Um, but they're very similar to a, a type of animal that we have here in Vermont. And a related question, are they related to panthers and cheetahs? Yes, yeah, leopards, panthers, cheetahs, uh, mountain lions, those are all in the same, in the same basic feline group, yes. <laughs> and one last question we didn't get to earlier, um, but a student who is still thinking about cuttlefish, are they related to chameleons? Um, well, they're wonder I think you already said that they're related to octopuses. They were wondering about that. Right. But are, are chameleons related, related to them also? Right. So th that's, that's, an interest, that's an interesting question. Of course, uh, chameleons are lizards, right? And they live on land. So they are not related to the cuttlefish, which are mollusks and sea creatures. Those two different types of animal are very far apart on, on the kind of the evolutionary tree. But the reason that you probably might think that they're closer related than that is because they both have the same adaptation, right? They can both change the color of their skin whenever they want to, right? We call that kind of thing, we call it convergent evolution, right? Lizards and mollusks are far apart in terms of on, on the evolutionary tree, like I just said, but they both develop the exact same adaptation and they both live in completely different parts of the world. So it's amazing that they kind of both developed the same skill, right? The same ability, um, but that happens a lot in nature, right? Think about what you saw here with the cuttlefish and the zebra, right? Zebra also live in a totally different environment than the cuttlefish and it's certainly true that zebras and cuttlefish have never met one another. Um, but even still, they, they came up with the same strategy for avoiding predators, right? This kind of thing happens all the time in nature. It's very cool. Any other questions? Ooh. That's good. Um, so what do, what do snow leopards eat? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, I, you know, hmm. I don't think I could tell you precisely what snow leopards eat because I don't actually know a whole lot about, about <laughs> snow leopards and where they live. But like the large felines, like mountain lions that live around here, they probably prey on, um, on small mammals. Think of things like woodchucks, uh, marmots that probably live in the areas which are similar to woodchucks that, that these guys are living. And then also uh, young, larger mammals. So think about fawns, think about young porcupines and rodents and things like that. Uh, that kind of food is mostly what they're hunting for. Also birds, uh, land birds, like, uh, like turkeys, small mammals like rabbits, yeah. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> so moving away from animals now, well, one of these here is an animal, that is true. There are lots of, plants, particularly animals, and also non-living things in nature that are symmetrical, right? Symmetry, the definition of symmetry, means that one half of something is identical to the other half. A simple example is think of your face. Your face is almost perfectly symmetrical. You could cut your face in half <laughs> and the one half would be almost the same as the other half, even though they're on two different sides of your face. Right. That's true of most animals like that leopard that we just saw. Its face is also symmetrical. But think about the simpler things that you see all the time outside. Think of leaves, think of flowers, snowflakes like we have here. Those things are all symmetrical. And 
they're all symmetrical in a particular way. For instance, this flower here and the starfish that you see up on the left, you should, you should call it a sea star and not a starfish because it's not a fish, right? <laughs> all sea, most sea stars and most flowers have five-sided symmetry. What does that mean? So I don't know if you can see, can you see my cursor here, Drew, on the, uh, on the screen? Yes? Okay, good. If, I, if you take your finger or your cursor and you draw out the sides that are formed on the, oh, now I lost my cursor. <laughs> on the starfish of the flower, you can see that it has one, two, three, four, five sides between the points of those petals. So it makes a pentagon, right? A five-sided flat figure. Same thing with the starfish here five sides. And if you cut this flower or starfish in half, one side would be the same as the other. The snowflake is an even more interesting example of this. The snowflake you might have already been able to see doesn't have five sided, -sided symmetry, but it has six sided symmetry. It's a hexagon if you draw it out. And the, fan the fantastic thing about snowflakes is that every single snowflake that's ever existed has six sides. Every snowflake has six-sided symmetry. This one is almost a perfect hexagon. They don't have to be perfect hexagons. Sometimes they're long crystals. But every single snowflake has six sides and they're symmetrical sides because water molecules, if you were to look at this snowflake under a super strong microscope, water molecules, when they attach to one another and freeze, they arrange themselves into a six-sided hexagon molecule structure. So this entire large snowflake has six sides. And even if you looked at the very smallest part of the snowflake, the water molecule that makes it up, there are billions of water molecules. Well, yeah, probably billions of water molecules in one very small snowflake. Each one of those molecules is also a six-sided symmetrical figure. So that's, to me, the fascinating thing about snowflakes. You might have heard that every snowflake is unique. That's not exactly true. They're, depending on the temperature, you can actually find a lot of snowflakes that are really quite similar because of the crystal structure of it and because all of those molecules are six-sided little hexagons. The more amazing thing to me is the fact that they are all six-sided. Every single snowflake in history is billions upon billions of trillions of past snowflakes. Yeah, Drew? Yeah, so one person's asking, but I thought that all snowflakes were different. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we got a bunch that's, of questions here. That's a little bit of an, of an urban myth, unfortunately, or a rural myth, I guess, in this case. Um, but, you know, uh, no, no two things are exactly the same. Right, so you know, every single human is slightly different from every single other human. Every rock is different from every other rock. So in that way, every single thing in nature is 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 totally unique, and every single snowflake is is a little bit unique. But snowflakes, all snowflakes, look a lot more similar than people think that they do when people think about them all having different shapes. It depends on the temperature. If all the snowflakes are about the same temperature, they'll be almost exactly the same form and shape. They'll look almost identical. Uh, yeah, Drew, another question. Yeah, so would a snowflake ever just be one whole hexagon with no fancy shapes inside of it? I think maybe like your slide here. Yeah, so that's that's a good question. So th th that again depends on temperature. Um, so if you've ever seen sleet, or I guess hail, I'm never sure about the difference between sleet and hail. I guess sleet is wetter. But if you, if you look at a hail stone, a hail stone is a snowflake, but it's a snowflake that's a solid crystal, right? If the conditions in the atmosphere are just right, instead of getting a fluffy flake like this, you can get a solid crystal that forms as a big solid uh, hexagonal prism, right? Um, so yes, that's true. You can, if you're interested in snowflakes after this, I encourage you to go on the internet right after we're done and try to find a snowflake temperature chart. And that will show you that at some temperatures, you'll see that snowflakes are, are really crystal. They look more like rocks than like flakes like this. 
You have another question, Drew? Yeah, so actually two that are both on your starfish. Um, okay. One is, what is the red on the starfish? And the other is, do starfish have veins? Oh, wow, okay, those are good questions. So starfish are echinoderms. Um, so they're related to sea urchins too. These are very, very, very simple, uh, very simple animals. <laughs> The top of the starfish there, where you're seeing all of the red, though that is this, the stomach area of the starfish. That's where all of its internal organs are. Um, it's red in color, just because that's the color that this starfish is particularly. Most starfish, their center part like that, where all of their organs are, is a different color from their arms. Um, if you know anything about starfish, you've probably heard that the starfish can actually lose their arms. Their arms can be cut off and those arms will regrow. Re um, so that's, that's very cool. And that also accounts for some of the difference in color. A new arm on a starfish will be very different from in color from the rest of the starfish. Um, the other question, do starfish have veins? I'm actually not Totally, I'm actually not totally sure about that. Whether starfish have veins. I can take that one actually. Oh, they, do you know? They, um, they don't have veins in the way that, you know, we as humans would think about them with red blood, you know, flowing through them. But they do have a very simple vascular system and it's, it's hydraulics basically, it's water pressure. Oh. And that's how they, how they propel themselves in part two. Uh -huh. um, and Michael, maybe you want to take this question also on starfishes. How does a starfish eat? Oh, <laughs> that's, that's very cool. So uh, starfish, if you look at the underside of a living starfish, the bottom of it is covered with hundreds, sometimes thousands of little tiny feet that it uses. They're little suckers. They look, I don't know what they would look, they look a little bit like the bottom of a, a snail or a slug. And they use those little suckers to move slowly across the ocean floor. And right in the center of them on the bottom, there's a little basically hole in their body where their stomach is. And one of the super cool things that starfish will do is they like to eat crustaceans, so crabs and things like that, and also mollusks, so like clams and snails and things with a shell. And what they can do is they can move slowly across the ocean floor on and go on top of a, of a clam or a shell and they can actually pull the shell open with those little tiny suction feet and then they can take their stomach and they actually push it through their mouth so that their stomach comes outside of their body and inside and they can basically swallow up that open clam and they can digest the clam outside of their body with their stomach. It's very gross, it's kind of cool. <laughs> so yeah, it's, uh, that's, that's one, one way that some types of starfish can eat. Yes, true. Yeah, now changing gears back to snowflakes again, is there a limit on the size of a snowflake? Huh, that is quite interesting. But, and so really, the, I'm not totally sure about this, but the thing that I do know is that, so everybody has seen snow sometimes where it comes down in huge puffy cotton ball flakes, right? Those snowflakes aren't one single snowflake, but instead lots and lots and lots of snowflakes stuck together. Um, so when you see snow that's really large like that, those aren't individual snowflakes. In terms of one single snowflake, I'm not really sure how big they can get. That's a good question. That's something that you could look up on the internet and uh, find out for yourself. Yeah. Yes. And then two questions related to your flowers. Um, maybe these are related. One person asking, why does the flower look like it has veins in it? And, mm -hmm. and then another person from YouTube asking, why are flowers different colors? Ah, okay. <laughs> so to the vein question, you're really correct. Those are veins in the flower plants have their own vein system, just like humans and mammals do. Most animals have arteries and veins that take blood to your heart and away from your heart. Plants have what are called xylem and phloem, and they really work the same way as your veins and arteries do. Particularly, they move water around the plant, right? Uh, leaves are 
leaves and petals and the stem are all different organs of a plant and they all need to have water and sap sugar energy delivered to them and that includes these petals here so those are literally veins that are bringing uh, fuel to those organs in the plant right the reason that flowers have different colors is that flowers are really designed to be um to be like landing platforms for pollinating insects like bees right we talked about bees and wasps earlier but bees and wasps collect uh nectar from flowers in order to feed their babies right um they they can see certain colors very well and so bees a bee would would be able to see this flower and pick it out very easily because of its bright color and it would know that that's a place to go to get nectar flowers rely on that because as bees collect nectar for their hives for their young baby bees they also really accidentally collect pollen off of a flower and they'll bring that pollen you can sometimes see it stuck to the legs of bees they'll have all this yellow pollen stuck to them the bees will bring that pollen from flower to flower and that's how flowers uh, can cross breed and reproduce so the flowers are helped by it and the bees are helped by it but that's the reason why they're brightly colored like that yes drew yeah and um just two last questions maybe before we move on but um, this is related to the answer you just gave on flowers. What's that white thing on this particular flower? Yeah, <laughs> so the white thing in the center of the flower, most flowers have one, but they look different from flower to flower, is called the pistil. Uh, and that's basically the reproductive organ of the flower. It produces pollen, which is, the, uh, which is basically the sperm of plants. And it also has the egg organ in it um which i forget the name of <laughs> so when when a bee visits one flower and picks up pollen it takes the sperm from that flower and it'll bring it to another flower and hopefully that pollen will get into the egg area of the pistil of that flower and it will uh uh it uh what, what's the word <laughs> um i'm blanking on the word Well, fertilize yes thank you dad <laughs> my dad called it out from the other room right it'll fertilize that flower exactly <laughs> and, and our last question going back to starfish do they eat other small fish and we know that you said they eat mollusks like clams and mussels and they eat other echinoderms or gastrite or crustaceans you said mm -hmm. what about small fish um uh, I think all echinoderms, including starfish, are way too slow to be able to catch any kind of fish, no matter how fast it is. Starfish move extremely slow, but they might scavenge uh, fish that have died and have settled to the bottom. I actually don't know about that. that. If you're interested in starfish, that would be an interesting thing to read up on, the eating habits of starfish. <laughs> okay, those were all the questions. I'm going to move on here. So now we're back to the spiral that we've mentioned earlier at the beginning of all of this. So the image that you see up on the top left, that might actually be familiar with you depending on how much you are interested in math. That is a very particular spiral and it's called uh, the Fibonacci sequence or the golden ratio. It's a spiral that is, that is formed using a very specific, um, ratios of length and you could see these squares here that make up the spiral each one of those squares is in a two to one ratio and the magic thing about this spiral is that you can continue it absolutely forever without it ever running into itself that might be a little bit uh confusing and hard to think about but if you look at the center the smallest part of the spiral on the left here I could continue drawing that spiral inward, closer and closer and closer and closer to itself, infinitely closer, but it will never, ever, ever touch itself. No matter how long I continue drawing it, it'll eventually get so small that I, that I wouldn't be able to draw it with any human pen or tool, right? Um, 
but that's that's kind of a magical math thing. But the amazing thing about this spiral, apart from that, is that nature often uses this exact spiral, these exact ratios, these two to one ratios, when it builds. That's not really the correct way to talk about it. But when plants or animals evolve spirals like this, they often evolve in this particular ratio. So on the right here, you see a mountain goat with its horns, right? Mountain goat's horns do form in a spiral and they continue to grow throughout the, the animal's life. When you see a very, very old mountain, uh, sorry, did I say mountain goat? This is a big horn sheep. I get them confused. <laughs> but if you find a very old bighorn sheep, you can actually see how that spiral will continue to get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, but it will not, if the sheep is healthy, that spiral will never break or get lodged into the rest of the animal or something like that. So it uses this Fibonacci sequence in order to keep the animal safe. You might have seen uh, boars or beavers that have big tusks or big teeth. If they let them grow too much, they can actually grow into the animal and hurt the animal. But the bighorn sheep gets around that problem by having very specially mathematic horns. Do you have a question, Drew? Yeah, actually, we got a, a couple questions. Will a, will a goat, the person asked, but I guess a bighorn sheep in this case, yeah. will their horn ever have ever spiral more than three times? Hmm, I don't know. So these animals don't live a super long time um, out in the wild. Maybe in captivity, you could get one that would that will <laughs> that will have lots of spirals. I'm not sure. That's again something that you could definitely look up on the internet. Try to find a picture of a very old bighorn sheep and see how many times that horn can spiral. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I've seen one where it's come back on itself at least once. I've never seen three times, but that's yeah. just <laughs> anecdotal. Yeah. <laughs> and um, one person perhaps anticipating your next talking point, but what's that plant in the bottom left? Yeah, right. So that is, that's a type of aloe plant, like aloe vera, something that we sometimes use on our hands for sunburns and things like that. Uh, this is a kind of succulent plant that grows along the ground. And this is an example of many Fibonacci sequence spirals put together. The way this plant grows is it grows out from the center and it continues growing in this spiral fashion. And because it uses this special spiral, it can grow to a very big size without running into itself or crowding itself out. Um, there are even a lot of plants that you can find in Vermont that grow in a spiral like this, particularly sunflower seeds. If you look at the head of a sunflower, that's that's an adult sunflower, you can actually see that all the seeds are arranged in spirals so that that sunflower can fit as many seeds as possible into its head. Yeah, pine cones too will spiral like that. Yes, Drew. And is there juice inside an aloe vera plant like that? Right, yeah, so all succulent plants, they're called succulent plants because if you, if you break open those, I don't know if you would call them leaves, I guess they're not leaves, but if you break open those parts of the plant, they're really just filled with, <laughs> filled with this kind of fleshy pulpy juice. Um, and that's where we get that aloe vera juice from. You squeeze, you squeeze out that goop. <laughs> yes, Drew? And maybe last question before we go on. Will mm. goats, and this is going back to your bighorn sheep, but will their horns ever fall off? Huh. Um, f fall off on their own? I don't know about that. So you know that um, uh, animals like moose and deer, their antlers fall off every season, right? Or, you know, once a year, right? During a particular season after the rut is over. And then those horns will grow back for the rest of the year. Bighorn sheep, their horns continue growing throughout their whole lifespan and they don't fall off because they actually use their horns in order to, the males will compete with one another for females by, and I'm sure you've seen this, by bashing into one another with their horns in a kind of ritual fight. So um, it's helpful for a bighorn sheep to have very big mature adult horns because it makes its head heavier and better in those contests, right? Um, what else was I gonna say? I forget what I was gonna say next, but. 
yeah, that's my answer. <laughs> Is there another question? No, okay. So the spiral, remember I said at the beginning, nature, nature loves the spiral. It's nature's favorite shape. So going all the way down to small plants and animals like the succulent plants and the bighorn sheep we just showed, those, those things, those organisms use spirals. We can find spirals there, but we can even find spirals really in, in the largest parts of the natural world, right? This is an image of a whirlpool galaxy, which is the same type of galaxy that our own Milky Way galaxy is. And because of the force of gravity at the center of this galaxy, there's a large black hole that's pulling in hundreds of trillions of stars and other planets uh, and gas into a big swirling whirlpool. But this big swirling whirlpool, because of gravity actually takes the form of this kind of spiral, right? So we can find spirals everywhere in the natural world. It's pretty amazing. <laughs> Our own solar system takes the form of a spiral too over millions of years as the planets move closer to the sun. Yes, Drew? So here's a question to re related to this idea of spirals and that they follow the Fibonacci sequence. How did Fibonacci come up with this idea or the idea of a sequence like this? If, if ah, you have so that, <laughs> that's, that's a good question. And I don't think that I know the complete story, but there, um, when we were talking about Euclid earlier and the very early Greek mathematicians, there was another early Greek mathematician whose name was Pythagoras. Um, if you've done any algebra, you've probably heard of the Pythagorean theorem, which he didn't come up with. Euclid came up with. He just takes the credit for it. But Pythagoras is famous for coming up and, and talking about the idea of the pentagram. The pentagram is a, is a kind of star-like shape. I unfortunately don't have a picture of it here. Um, I could look one up really fast. Is this going slow? Oh, I also, I don't want to show anything that's copyrighted either. So maybe I won't do this. <laughs> well, anyway. <laughs> uh, we actually have a question while you're, while you're looking at that. Um, they're wondering if your slide yeah. is of the N51 galaxy, M51 galaxy. Yeah, I think it, um, oh, I read it when, when I got this slide off the internet, I read which galaxy it is and now I forget. It is, uh, yeah, I'm forgetting. I think that might be correct. <laughs> that may be true. There are lots of uh, whirlpool type galaxies um, that we've gotten pictures of and, and discovered, and this is one of them. <laughs> um, but, sorry, <laughs> uh, I was talking about uh, Pythagoras. Pythagoras developed the idea of this pentagram, which is a star, star shaped figure. And if you unroll the sides of this pentagram and arrange them in the shape of a spiral. That's how you get the Fibonacci sequence. So the, the pentagram is considered this perfect shape. Um, it's, it's a shape that you can, yeah, this is confusing. It's a shape that you can make every other type of shape out of by arranging its different ratioed sides in, in certain arrangements. One of those arrangements is these boxes here that you see around the Fibonacci sequence spiral, right? So that's where um, that's where the spiral comes from. That's another interesting thing to, to go and look up on the internet. I don't actually know very much about um, Fibonacci himself. I would have to go. I've, I've, I learned about it in college, but now I forget. So I'll have to go and read about it again. <laughs> okay. So moving on to some more patterns here. We don't have too much time, so I'm going to have to go through some of these patterns quickly. This is a common one that everybody knows about, but is, is really a kind of mysterious pattern that we find in nature. The wave, of course, right? The wave is a fascinating pattern because you will never find a still wave. Waves only happen when there's movement, right? A wave has to be moving to be a wave, right? This is a wave in water. 
that's of course caused by winds and the tide influence of the moon. You can find waves in any ocean and even really large bodies of water like the Great Lakes have waves like this. You can make waves yourself by throwing any heavy object into a body of water, right? Those ripples that you make are waves just like the waves that you see in the ocean on a smaller scale that are radiating through the water. When we talk about waves, the tricky thing about waves is that, for instance, this wave here, the water itself isn't moving. The water is all really staying in the same place, but it's just the wave that's moving through the water. You can experience that yourself when you go swimming and you can actually see that when a wave comes by you in the ocean, as long as you're not too close to the shore, all the wave will do is just bob you up and down, right? It won't take you with it unless you're right close to the beach. So waves are very cool because, um, <laughs> because they have to move through something to be a wave. And so we can find waves in water, that's the easiest place. But the other fascinating place you can find a wave is really in the exact opposite type of spot that you would find a water wave, right? If you go to a desert ever, you can find identical waves in these dunes. Dunes also move very slowly across a desert over time. They're being pushed by the wind. So those waves are moving much slower than the waves in the ocean, but they are still waves of the same type. In this picture on the left here, you can actually see this dune being moved. You can see some of, that, um, some of the sand on the top of this dune being blown off, off of the crest of that wave towards the trough, which is the low part of the wave, right? So these dunes move slowly across the, this desert. But also, if you look at the dune itself, there are even small waves on that large wave, also made by the wind here. Those little ripples, those are also slowly moving little up and down waves. There's a better picture of them on the right here. They're actually a very, very pretty looking pattern. Going forward, similar to a wave in its shape, in its look, this is a pattern that we call a meander, right? You may have heard of a river or a stream that meanders, right? That's, that term comes from this geometrical term. A meander is any kind of pattern that doubles back on itself like this. A snake uses this meander pattern in order to move itself, in order to propel itself, right? When it snakes back and forth, it's meandering from one side to another and using that force to push itself forward. Rivers do the exact same thing in very, very, very slow motion. This above picture is, um, I think this is the Rio Negro, which is a river that moves across a very flat area of land. Any river, in ideal conditions, like flat land like this, every river will want to move in a meander like this. Rivers will always try to form themselves in a meander. They won't shoot themselves straight down through a landscape like this. Um, hydrodynamics, the way that water prefers to move, makes it so that rivers will always want to form a meander like this. So this is a pattern that you can find Certainly in your backyards here in Vermont, if you follow or map out the, the pattern that a stream or river takes, you'll likely find that it meanders like this. Next one to go over quickly is a simple one, uh, cracks, of course. Cracks are a kind of pattern that forms in nature whenever a surface becomes really stressed out. For instance, this used to be a mud flat here. All of this dirt used to be mud. It dried up over a period of time from the sun and from a lack of water. And as it does that, it forms these cracks. You can see identical cracks like this probably if you look at your knuckles right now. This is a very dry season and your skin doesn't get the moisture that it gets in other seasons if you don't moisturize like I don't. I should, but I don't. And if I look at my knuckles here, you won't be able to see it in the camera, but my knuckles have all deep cracks in them, just like this, <laughs> just like this mud does. These cracks also form with other kinds of stress. For instance, 
as the ice starts to melt across the ponds here in Vermont here, and it begins to crack, you can see the exact same types of cracks in pond ice that you can see on your knuckles or in really dried out mud. It's the same kind of crack that if you took a large rock and threw it onto a backyard pond that you have right now, you could see the stress cracks that that rock makes as it, as it hits the surface of the ice, causes stress and forms cracks. The next one, this is a favorite one of mine. Oh, we'll, we'll do a question really fast before we get into this one. Well, I think it was just one person looking at your meander slide. I'm wondering how big do snakes actually get? Do they, <laughs> re do they leave really huge meanders? Hmm. It depends. Uh, it depends on the kind of snake. Here in Vermont, uh, I think the largest snake that lives around here would be the uh, like a black rat snake, which which, uh, which can be very long. I once I once saw one that was probably four or five feet long. But there are snakes that can be very long, and that's true that they do have very large, wide meanders when they slither. The bigger a snake is, that's true. Yeah. But so. This pattern that we're looking at right here, this is called, it has a funny name, it's called tessellation. But that word tessellation is where we get our word tile from. You might have guessed that this is a picture of fish scales and these scales are tessellated, they're tiled onto one another and they overlap kind of like shingles on a roof, right? If you've ever stripped the scales off of a fish, you've probably found that those scales themselves are hard. They're like chips, they're firm. They're kind of like plastic, plasticky feeling, I guess. <laughs> but when all of those scales are on a fish and overlapping one another, they kind of form a little sheet of armor around the fish that helps to protect it. But that sheet of armor, even though it's hard because all of those scales are overlapping, it still allows the fish to have a lot of movement, right? those scales can all stretch and move as the fish moves. And those tiles give the fish a lot of protection, but also allow the fish to move very easily, much better than a hard single shell. Another organism that uses tessellation that you can find easily in Vermont is the pine cone, right? The pine cone, when it's sealed up, when the pine cone is young, those tiles overlap to form a, a, a complete shield, it completely covers the pine cone and protects the seeds inside. But as that pine cone dries out through the seasons, those tiles, those overlapping tiles will actually open up and then allow the seeds to fall out of the pine cone, right? So it's a shell that protects the pine cone, it, that protects the seeds, but because they're overlapping tiles, it also allows for them to open up and release the seeds when they're ready. Ah, okay. So this is, this is a very difficult kind of pattern. It, these two patterns, the top left pattern is on a brain coral. They look like meanders, right? But it's very difficult to see any kind of pattern there. Those meanders look crazy and all over the place. The bottom right picture is of a cone snail. And similarly, it has what looks like a pattern there of those triangle shapes and those brown and black squiggly lines, but it's, it's a crazy looking pattern, right? It's a pattern that if I asked you to try to draw that pattern repeatedly, you probably wouldn't be able to. It's so, so chaotic, right? It lacks any kind of reason behind it. These are patterns that we would call chaotic patterns, patterns that are hard to make sense of. And for a long time, we thought that these weren't really patterns at all. They were just random, totally crazy randomness. But with really modern mathematics and also powerful computers, we've developed, we've come up with a new kind of mathematics called chaos theory. And so very slowly and very carefully using a powerful calculator computer, we can actually figure out the, um, the mathematical equations that will give us the patterns for these crazy looking shells or corals. We can actually get the exact, the exact equation so that we can repeat those crazy patterns. So even though those patterns are chaotic and, and difficult to follow, they are even 
they're, they're still truly patterns. They're still repeatable. They're just very, 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 very hard to repeat. <laughs> so this is, this is a computer image of a computer doing all of the math to come up with this one of these chaos patterns. Yes, Drew? Um, we have one question. I know we're just about out of time. Yeah. So um, it's just related to the galaxy stuff. And okay. they're wondering if the spiral of a black hole works the same way that you would get sucked in in a spiral shape as well. Right, yeah. So in, the, um, in space, any, uh, any point of gravity, whether it's a planet or a sun or a black hole, um, it, it will tend to pull things towards itself. Of course, that's what gravity does. That's what's pulling us towards the center of the earth right now. But out in outer space, because everything has some kind of velocity already, whenever anything gets pulled towards that black hole, it's not going to get pulled straight down. It's going to get pulled around in a spiral, spiraling closer and closer and closer until it gets sucked into the black hole. So the black hole is the cause of that spiral that you see in the galaxy and even in our own galaxy. That's right. Okay, is that the question? <laughs> The very, the very, very, very last thing that we're going to talk about here, which is the craziest kind of pattern to me, even crazier than the chaos theory stuff, is the fractal pattern. This is another kind of geometrical pattern that we've only really understood more recently in the history of mathematics, right? A fractal is any kind of pattern that repeats itself the closer down you look at something, right? That's a hard, it's very hard to, to imagine uh, what that means. But if you look at, for example, this fern here, we'll take this, this top fern that I'm circling right now. If you look at this entire fern, its basic shape is of a, of a triangle or really like a diamond, right? So this tip here, a tip here, down here, like that. It has this kind of shape. So that's the entire fern. Now let's look down a little bit more closely at it. Let's take, for instance, just one frond of this fern. So let's take this one here. And you'll probably immediately notice that this one branch or frond of the fern has the exact same shape as the entire fern itself, right? It has this diamond shape. And not only that, but if we were looking at the large fern, it's made up of all of these tiny leaf blades, right? And similarly, the one single frond of this fern is also made up of all these tiny leaf blades. If I took a zoomed in picture of just this frond and then a zoomed out picture of the whole fern, you might not be able to tell the difference between the two because they have an identical pattern. They're almost exactly the same. And now you can look down even closer into the parts that make up this fern. Now look just into one leaf, I know that they're not called leaves, I forget what they're called, of the fern here. If you look at just this one here, again, it has that diamond triangular shape. And it's also made up of all of those leafy blades that are arranged on its sides. And then even if you look at an even closer level at just one of those little tiny blades that are pointing out, if you look at it with a microscope, even those little blades have a diamond shape and then little, little tiny blades pointing out off of them. So that is how a fractal works. It's any, any kind of pattern that repeats itself the closer you look at it. It's the same deal with this plant on the right. This is a similar plant to a dandelion. It is a spherical head of the plant connected by a long stalk, right? So here's the spherical head. Here is the stalk. But then if you look closer, the parts that make up the spherical head are themselves little tiny spheres on stalks connecting them here. And then if you look at one of these little spheres, it itself is all made out of little tiny spheres, which here are the little flower heads of this plant connected by little, little tiny stalks. So it's, it's spheres on a stalk connected to spheres on a stalk connected to spheres on a stalk and it keeps repeating itself like that. So that's how fractals work. And then to tie everything back to where we were earlier, 
the snowflake is probably the best example that you can find of a, of a true fractal because of the crystal structure that I was talking about before. Every snowflake is a six-sided um, symmetrical figure because at the very bottom, the closest you can look, the smallest part of a snowflake, it's a molecular water structure, is a six-sided symmetrical figure, just like the big picture. And so just to make that clear with this image, if you look, it has six sides, one, two, three, four, five, six. But if you look at one of these crystals right at the edge here, let's take this one at the bottom because it's easiest to see. This is also a six-sided symmetrical hexagon, right? Because it has one, two, three, four, five, six sides, right? So <laughs> fractals are a tricky, a tricky kind of pattern, uh, but I encourage you to go out and uh, try to find them because just like spirals, fractals are actually everywhere in nature. You just have to kind of know where to look for them. <laughs> so that is the end of my little presentation here. Do we have any more questions, Drew, before we sign off for today? No, I, I think we answered them all during the session. We had over 50, it looks like. So, oh, wow. Okay, yeah. good. I, nice. I answered a few in writing. So make sure you check yeah. the Q&A transcript, everybody, if you didn't hear your, your question answered during today's class. Yes. And I just wanted to thank everybody for, again, for joining us. Of course, everybody who joined us in Zoom and asked questions in our Q&A, uh, everybody who's been on our YouTube live stream and asked some great questions on there as well, and who, as well as everybody who may join us later when they view this on their local cable access television or on Kingdom Access Television with whom we're partnered to, to try to bring these classes out to our communities in Vermont. Um, so once again, Thank you, Michael, for a wonderful, wonderful session. Um, my name is Drew Bush, and I just want to remind you that at the Fairbanks Museum, we're working on a lot of different online programming. So definitely check out fairbanksmuseum.org, our Facebook page. On the website itself, if you're looking for more classes like this one, you can go to the learning tab and underneath on the drop down, you'll see virtual learning. So thank you once again, everybody, for joining us, and we look forward to having you in a class again with us soon. Bye. Bye, right, guys. Thank you. See you soon.